I'm here with Cole Mannix of the Old Salt Co-op, uh, based out of Helmsville, Montana, uh, and also Helena, Montana. Uh, Cole, uh, could you start out by just uh, telling me, telling us a little bit about yourself and uh, how this co-op got started? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. Um, yeah, my name is Cole Mannix, and uh, I grew up in ranching. Um, my family, my my mom and dad, and my dad's two brothers and their spouses. And then uh, my siblings and cousins all, um, you know, grew up on the same place. And so um, the, the first parts of the family came out in the 1880s. Um, and we've basically managed the same place uh, since then. And we, you know, I think we were raised to not think of ourselves as owners. You know, owner, ownership is a, is a, we're here for a short time land and and what it supports is here for a long time and that was part of just the the way grandma and grandpa talked about the ranch um and uh you know we all just really love the community home built too we love living there um all the uh, um the beauty of what the place offers and um so stewardship is really important to us um we had started you know Agriculture has a lot of um, forces pulling against it um, and kind of forcing it to grow um, or sort of grow or die if, if, it, if it needs to support livelihoods on the land. Um, you know, the, the, basically the trend, as, you know, as everybody knows, is that you've got to kind of increase the units you sell and, and decrease the price per unit. And basically the thing that has been sucked out of agriculture is the labor component, the human component, and been replaced with other inputs of you know, energy and, and uh, we know where that comes from. And so we, you know, as a, as a family that loves just living in a place and loves having a community there, our goal has always been to support more jobs. And it's, so there's this tension between how profitable the ranch is and how many livelihoods it supports. And so we've always, you know, just tried to balance that carefully. Um, yeah, we might be able to be more profitable by going in one direction or another, uh, but there's but there's a trade-off there between how many folks it supports. And so we've usually erred on the side of supporting more families. And uh, marketing local beef, I think we started doing that in the early 2000s. Um, you know, we've been a commodity operation for a lot of years. It used to be sheep back, you know before the 70s, um, primarily with some cattle, but now primarily just cattle. Um, and, but we, you know, we would sell calves out of state just like everybody would at the end of the year. And we still do that with the bulk of our operation. 90% of what we sell is still commodity. But we have for 20 some years now tried to build up uh, our own more uh, regional and local control over, <laughs> over the foods, over our own destiny. Um, as a way partially of just stepping outside of an industry that we, we you know, we don't like a certain extreme version of it. Um, and also, and then also as a way of hopefully just capturing a little bit more value and driving it back to the stewardship of the land. And um, so we, we, we created a beef program, um, Mannix Grass Finished Beef that is mostly sold in the Missoula area. And and uh, we grew to where we're at now, which is about 150 animals per year really quickly. Uh, but then it, the growth really stopped because you kind of reached this threshold where most of the early adopters have, you know, already been purchasing from you or purchasing from another little small brand like you. That, you know, the good food stores of the world are very few and far between, especially in Montana. And so to grow beyond that, you know, 150 per year sort of threshold where we market, you know, well over a thousand animals a year takes this massive jump in processing investment because that doesn't exist. <laughs> that kind of processing scale doesn't exist locally, but you don't want to make that processing investment until you know you can sell it. Um, so there's this chicken and the egg problem of how do you go out there and build a market and a following without the processing capacity to really create a beautiful product that people like and deliver it conveniently and you know, have the ordering process be streamlined. And so Old Salt Co-op was a, <clears throat> my family, um, you know, like many others has had that experience. Um, so we 
teamed up with a couple of others, um, Seabin Livestock Company, um, which has a local lamb program, but like us sells, you know, most of what they produce out of, you know, anonymously. And then another one called JBRL. And uh, we thought that together we could make the processing investment if we, if we got outside help and also would have significant scale between the three of us. And yet we could start from a place where, you know, it was just three <laughs> and the way that we produce livestock, the way we manage land, our values is really aligned. So we would have both kind of a small, tightly knit set of values to start with, but also some significant scale. And, um, and then that wasn't enough um, on the co-op side. We, we, you know, it really appealed to us, the one share, one vote. But um, it wasn't enough because we really feel like meat is not like bread or clothing where you buy it and you take it home and it's just, you know, it's a great loaf of bread. You don't have to do anything. You just eat it or it's a great piece of clothing. I mean, meat is something that you have to then beautifully prepare and, and it can really be ruined even if the whole process was great before that. So we, we teamed up with basically um, a whole range of talent on the culinary and butchery and marketing kind of creative side that we think will give us hopefully the, the horsepower um, to, to reach people locally in a way that makes them fall in love with what we're doing and, and want to stay. And so we have created this business that um, is direct to consumer. The goal is sell meat to individuals, <clears throat> um, not to grocery stores primarily, not to rest other restaurants primarily, but <clears throat> if we can sell to enough individuals, let's say five to 10,000 people, then we can both have enough margin, but also keep it reasonably priced enough to, <clears throat> um, excuse me, to basically work for both sides of it. We get enough margin that we can return more value to the ranch. And they, um, because there's not this big distributor and retail margin in the middle, they get a reasonable enough price on their end. And- <clears throat> So you're running this as, as sort of a, a CSA model, is that right? Yeah, we're calling it like an old salt share, but it, it's essentially that. It's basically, we will deliver these shares um, direct door to door. And you can sign up for, you know, kind of a more basic share, which is, um, you know, made up of primals that rotate, you know, what those primals are based on the relative portion that they show up on an animal. <clears throat> so uh, traditionally, can you explain what primals are for, for me yeah. and other people not familiar with the terminology here? Yeah. So um, one of the biggest challenges of, of, you know, selling meat is that by far the majority of meat by percentage basis from an animal is ground is ground beef right and you only have a very small percentage of that carcass that is ribeye or tenderloin and so it's really easy to sell out of that and then you've got this backup of inventory from ground beef and and um, trimmings that is hard to move at a price point that can still allow you to be whole on the overall animal and so selling shares of an animal basically just allows you to sell proportionately um, to people based on what the relative percentages that come on an animal. And so we expect at least now, at least at the outset here, but the program hasn't launched yet. <clears throat> we expect to sell the um, middle meats, the steaks, the New Yorks, the tenderloins, the ribeyes on a share basis. And then within those sort of shares that you sign up for that you can sign up for one that is arrives weekly, monthly, or annually, right? Or you can sign up for one that is a higher value share that is going to have more pounds per meat in it, weekly, monthly, or annually. And then we'll also put, you know, things like a beef ragu sauce in there and tallow to cook with and things like that. <coughs> and then there'll be other things that are a la carte, like ground beef, jerky, things that we can offer on just however much you want basis. Um, and then here in Helena, we'll have a butcher shop where you can buy a la carte, even ribeyes and, and New Yorks. It'll, and it'll be just, you know, really a showcase of the meat. And it'll be, you know, one place where we can just say, hey, well, we can sell you whatever you want to buy. But in general, the way we succeed in 
flipping this problem, which is that 95% of the stuff we produce is sold out of state somewhere to someone who can't know the integrity behind this production. Now, our goal is to sell 95%, you know, to people that actually do have a chance of knowing these landscapes we produce in, knowing the integrity behind the production and even knowing us. And we think that the way we reach those folks is a little bit like, you know, what Sarah Calhoun and Red Ants Pants have, has done for her brand and for White Sulphur Springs is we, we can bring people out. Our plan is to have an annual festival that will be essentially a meat festival. We're thinking about calling it Four Fires. And that festival would be, you know, one, one evening the fire centers around beef and one morning, the, the next morning it centers around chicken and then pork and then a finale with lamb, let's say. And basically it would include music, but it would be centered around a culinary experience and it would allow people, you know, one year they come out to the ranch in the Blackfoot. The next year they go out and experience the landscape near Cascade where, where Stephen Livestock is at. You know, the next year, maybe they go out and experience that same thing um, near the Crazy Mountains near Melville. And they, they have a beautif beautifully presented food. They connect with each other. They connect with the ranches. We have some content that's basically allows us to share something about land management, wildlife conservation, all those kind of values, and allow people to engage with the kind of the deeper why behind all of this. Um, we, we are working to re basically on an adaptive reuse of an old stone masonry warehouse here in Helena that would be this flagship butcher shop and public house restaurant. Uh, again, basically just marketing, a way for people to experience what we are, what we are, um, the values, I guess, not only the food, but the values that we're trying to share. And that's, the, we launched the Outpost restaurant just a couple of months ago to do the first, uh, the kind of the first component of that. It's a little burger and fries concept with a chili and a salad, super simple. Um, the fries are um, Bausch potatoes from Whitehall. They're cooked in beef tallow. And, um, you know, the chili is all sourced from our meat. Um, basically every, the wheat, wheat Montana buns, everything's local except the greens. And it's a way to just show up in Helena, begin telling the story. It's our only business currently. It's the only actual enterprise we're running. And uh, it gives us a chance to just begin telling the story. And then the, the goal is to um, put a, a livestock harvest facility in Winston, Montana, between towns and, and um, East Helena, which would allow us to ship our livestock a, a much shorter distance. It's very centrally located for, to where these ranches are at. And um, we, you know, basically just a much lower stress process on them. And that not only is good for humane reasons, but it's really good for meat quality as well. So, it, it, so obviously you guys are still in the early stages here. Um, you've got, you say three uh, landowning families, th uh, three, th three people raising livestock. Is everybody doing beef specifically? Is it all beef or you have a variety? You know, right now, the meat program will likely start with just beef and maybe, uh, maybe incorporating lamb as well. Um, the mm -hmm. Seaman Livestock raises lamb as well as beef, um, and they sell that as a local locker program. Uh, but we both, um, Mannix, <clears throat> excuse me, both Mannix and Seven have sheep on their ranches every summer. We, we have um, uh, an arrangement with the Helena family where they bring out 1,200 sheep every summer from early July through the early part of September. And we get the weed control, the multi-species weed control. Uh, and it decreases the, we basically don't have to use chemical on nap weed anymore. Um, and so that they get the grazing and we get the weed control and we'd love to own those sheep, you know, own our own herd and market them if we had the market. And so mm -hmm. there's basically a lot more where that came from if we can develop the market. Right. So it, you've got your, your three ranching families now who are members of the co-op <clears throat> and it sounds like you're, um, you're wanting to sell, as you were saying, shares in this kind of CSA program. Um, and I know that you haven't got quite the details figured out yet, but is the uh, is your kind of idea right now that people buying those shares will be official members of the co-op um, and and have some kind of 
vote on on something within the co-op or is it more um just like you know paying for your portion of the of the meat yeah. um have you what are your thoughts on that because the co-op is structured as a there's two classes of membership there's a and b a is the producers and b is the workers okay. and we decided not to create for now uh, a class c membership that would be customers um, the, I think the first reason for that is just that a multi-stakeholder co-op was already so unknown to lawyers and accountants. And we have yeah, had yeah. Um, some good help from the Montana Cooperative Development Center, and yet multi-stakeholder co-ops are still, especially in the, this neck of the woods, not common. And there's also a little bit of tension between, right now, we just feel like the it, when it comes to meat, the, the national supply chain is so weighted towards lowest cost to consumer and we really we're trying to turn that around and say look the cost to customer does matter but you re but the the imbalance right now is most heavily um, an imbalance that doesn't pay workers enough and doesn't return enough value to land stewardship so we felt like there was a little bit of a conflict of interest there if we put in all of everybody as a member Yep. But we do, it, it's really, I mean, part of the, the, the name Old Salt is trying to get us out of a, a brand that says, hey, here's a bunch of ranches and cowboy boots and cowboy hats and lariats. And here's this kind of weird world that most people just don't maybe interact with and say, look, we're all, the purpose of being a human being is to enhance land and community around you rather than to we, we certainly can do the opposite of that and yet the beautiful thing about human beings uh, not that this is what we usually do but what we can do is we can actually be productive and so, and have a, an economy at a reasonable size and be smart in the way we use resources and we can actually enhance those resources and so that salt of the earth um kind of sentiment is 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 where old salt comes from. And it's not, we really don't want it to feel like, hey, it's these ranches that are doing these amazing things. And we just all, you know, passively participate in that. It really takes an entire complete supply chain where the customer intentionally participates and says, this is the kind of landscape and the kind of future I choose, <laughs> the kind of quality of food, the kind of landscape I want my children to live in. And so together we wanted old salt to feel like a, a brand that we we're all in it together. Right. So, so you've got your two share classes um, and how many of the class B shares, how many uh, workers are members of the co-op right now? So right now there's two, the two founding, there's two founding worker members of the co-op. Okay. And then we also have, you know, we have, um, Can ten, just other, ask those, 10 other are employees those... and those employees are eligible to basically uh, apply for membership after a year of employment yeah um, yeah yep. standard so, probationary period that's a, right. that's a, a common thing um so are those uh two the, the, currently the two uh worker members are they working in the in the restaurant side or are they on the ranch with you uh those the worker members are uh, myself um, and um, a gentleman named Andrew Mace, who currently lives in Portland. He's a chef and a whole animal butcher. He grew up in Montana, but he's moving back. Okay. And um, it's his menu that is being instituted at that restaurant. And uh, I am <laughs> spending actually a lot of shifts in the restaurant, but but at the same time working to build the broader um, set of enterprises that we're trying to do. So we um, kind of the, 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 the co-op is this umbrella entity. And mm -hmm. one of the entities that it owns is the outpost restaurant, this little wholly owned LLC and the co-op, the co-op employs all of the workers, but, and then it bills labor services essentially back to its, to the little LLC that it owns. Right. So all of the labor is run out of that umbrella co-op. Gotcha. Um, and, and so over time, then it sounds like the, 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 the hope is that the people working in that, you know, the, uh, 
at the outpost in, in the little restaurant, they're going to be, you know, is the idea that uh, everybody working there will be members and, um, I think the idea, the idea is, I guess, I think the idea is basically those employees who like what the co-op is doing, they're, they're, they get it, they want it, they have the capacity to do it. Right. Uh, they're, they're fun to be around. They're people that like, they, they, they want to be involved long-term. They want to have a vote for the board. They want to be eligible for the board. They want to share in profits. Then they can, you know, again, they can petition the board and the board can accept them as members but if mm. it's not that every worker has uh, to be a, member. a worker member i mean and some people just right. don't want that you want to the, the sort of the nature of the restaurant industry too is that you might just want something very part-time mm -hmm. um very flexible yeah, yeah. It, school you know yeah and, and it can be a a little bit of a contentious issue sometimes with some of the more um uh, I would say fundamentalist uh, <laughs> types of worker co-op people, usually people who don't have a whole lot of experience with actual worker co-ops who think like every person who works in this business needs to be a member or it's not a real worker co-op. And, you know, the realities, uh, you know, are often that not every, it's not for everybody. Not everybody wants to be an owner. They don't have that ownership mentality. They just want a part-time job to help pay their rent, you know, right. while they're in school or something like that. So, um, yeah, there are a lot of worker co-ops that, you know, operate like that. You know, some people are, are, are employees. There are some worker co-ops that it's, you know, you have your six month or one year probationary period. And at the end of that, it's either you become a member or you go find something else to do. But, um, oh. you know, the, 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 the kind of more <laughs> uh, flexible way of doing it, like you guys uh, are talking about, seems, uh, at least in my experience, from what I've seen, uh, is 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 pretty common. Um, so, you know, the, um, one, oh, sorry, I, I just I thinking about what you're saying there. I mean, the first enterprise just happens to be this restaurant, but the the next one will really be a, a meat processing business, and that business um, will likely be another wholly owned LLC by mm -hmm. the co-op, and its employees will be employed by the co-op, right, and and that's a profession where we've really lost a lot of meat processing talent, <laughs> um, yes, know-how yeah. skills, it, but it's a longer term role potentially. There's, there's just some people that they do enjoy working with their hands. And mm -hmm. we as a meat company really need to partner with those people. And so that's the kind of job in the co-op that makes much more sense for somebody who sees the long-term potential, wants to be an owner and mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. So for that, uh, you know, processing facility that you're hoping to build, are you going to do, do you foresee yourself expanding to more producers, uh, trying to get more producers on as members uh, to help finance that? I mean, I would think if nothing else, just to help finance the, the facility, because that's got to be multi-million dollar endeavor, right? Yeah, um, we we actually decided to so the, the first answer is that we do anticipate expanding our producer co-op membership, just like we anticipate expanding the worker co-op membership. Um, particularly at the, in, the begin, in the early days, it'll be a bit strategic of just like we, you know, we don't have a market, a big market yet. And so there's no point in just adding a bunch of people who still, we won't have enough customers that, right. to, to buy their supply. But we may add members who bring a species that we don't currently raise, <clears throat> that ha that do really align with our values. <clears throat> Maybe their operation is near an urban area that we want to market to, um, but that we don't currently have a, lo a ranch location that is right by that urban area. So re things like that may cause us to grow the producer membership sooner rather than later, but it probably won't be because we're trying to get more financing. We have kept the the membership to buy in at an incredibly low number, both for workers and for producers. And the way that producers invest over time and bring capital to the co-op over time is they basically buy marketing units. So if you want the right to be able to market hundred beef cattle per year through the co-op, you buy these hundred slots that you own uh, and you own those every year. And we have priced that separately from membership. So you have to be a member to own slots. But once you're a member, if you own 100 slots and now 
all of a sudden the co-op's demand is growing and we've got, you know, the opportunity for you to eat market even more than you buy your next hundred slots and you add that to the hundred you already have. So that's each one of those beef slots, for example, is priced at $250. And so, you know, you buy, buy a hundred slots for 25,000 and that's this source of capital that as the co-op grows, it can use that to pay down its debt and pay off investors. But the, actually the main way at the outset that we're paying for this multi-million dollar investment is through a non-equity uh, mechanism, which is revenue-based financing. So it's essentially a, we're selling a promissory note to investors that says, you know, you invest $100 today and we'll give you X amount back in five years. And that's it. It's an unsecured loan, essentially. It's a risky loan that pays off really nicely if we're successful. But it doesn't have any collateral. It, you know, it's, it's not a loan in the sense that, you know, they can, we, that we have to pay it, that we are um, like legally obligated to pay it back. Yeah. Like if, if we fail as a business, they don't have recourse. Yeah, they don't, they don't, yeah. yeah. And it, so, so this isn't a preferred share then. This is something That's different. Right. Um, we, so, we do have some preferred investment, which is, you know, uh -huh. this non-voting uh, class of stock. But we really are viewing that as number one, it's a way that we're about to launch a preferred campaign for basically so that friends and family can help uh, mm -hmm. people that are investing, you know, not for some big return. As you know, Montana co-op law caps the dividend on preferred stock. Yeah, 6%, I believe, right? Right. And so that's not really, a, you know, it's, it's not some super attractive return if, if all you're focused on is bottom line. But it's a way for friends and family to participate at small levels, like five hundred dollars shares, um, mm -hmm. and it's also a way for as the ranches, which are very risk averse, understandably, as they see, hey, this is starting to work, let's buy down more expensive money. They can now they can invest in that preferred stock, and we can use that investment to pay off the bank or pay off this revenue-based financing, which is more expensive to the co-op. And, and, and so the revenue based financing, then it does the, it has a repayment rate. So is it structured like a loan? And then there's some kind of like a benchmark for profitability that you have to hit before those loan payments get made back? Or is it like the more profitable, the more they get back? <clears throat> so it, basically the, the faster the the faster that we it, it's a share of revenue so in our case it's three percent of gross revenue okay. and it's it's gross revenue for, for the co-op not the individual enterprises the overall co-op it's mm -hmm. gross revenue um, our investors share in that pro rata so if for example if we've got if we've got a, a million dollar um revenue-based financing round and somebody invests a hundred thousand dollars then they will share in 10% of 3% of our gross revenue. Gotcha. Until they get paid back a certain rate. So we basically said, you'll share in 3% of our gross revenue pro rata until you get back 1.5 X your money. Okay. And, and, and basically their calculus is, okay, well, how big is their gross revenue? How quickly? And that- right. If they get back 1.5x their money in three years, that's a really good return on investment. If it takes us seven years, that's still decent, but it's not as good. And mm -hmm. so that's their risk calculation is, um, you know, how good is 3% of, you know, what the gross number is and how likely are they right. to hit that? How quickly? Yeah. And, and, and so the, just so I'm understanding this, the, uh, so the maximum amount that will go back to this uh, uh, revenue, uh, financing is um it is three percent and so whoever is investing in that they're all just sharing in that that three percent that's right of the gross okay um well that, that that's uh i think then yeah that's the first time i've i've, I've heard about a co-op using that kind of system so i'm kind of uh, it's very interesting to me as a as somebody with an economics degree that has not been put to very good use, it's always <laughs> it's super um, it's kind of stuff I, I love to hear about. Um, so you've got uh, you, your, your three producer members, your couple of um, worker members. Uh, 
and and you've got some big plans it sounds like and a lot of different things that you're wanting to get into uh do you have a a timeline for um for you know like building out the production facility or is this kind of as you can make it work yeah there's um my hope is that by the end of uh january we will have put um the, the slaughter, the harvest facility on order, you have to have half the money down um, mm. to put one on order. And then it will, it could be operational as soon as November, 2022. Wow. Uh, th basically these units are built uh, in Northwestern Washington. They are modular. So they're built out of shipping containers. And, um, <clears throat> you know, there's some customizability, but essentially they sit on concrete pads. Um, you drill a well. You have septic. We're going to do composting um, of uh, viscera and anything that you know can't be marketed uh, initially. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> we already have raised enough money to, to do that. We have a really wonderful. Um, partnership uh, that is developing between a bank called Steward. And, and the co-op, they, they are um, a certified B corporation. They focus on regenerative agriculture, regional food systems. Uh, they, they have a lot of staff in Portland and have done a couple of projects there. Um, and, you know, they've, they just placed their first staff member in Montana um, just this summer and have been working with him. Um, the owner of the bank, one of my uh, advisors in the project and good friends um, grew up with him on the East Coast. And, and anyway, um, they, their values really align with ours. And um, so we continue to make progress thinking that, yep, yeah, this is the that's right great. financer for us. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that's great. I mean, I, I, I've, you know, I live in uh, Hot Springs. I don't know if I mentioned that to you yet, but, uh, you know, kind of out here in a little different part of the state. Um, you know, up in the Flathead Valley, and we've, uh, I know a couple of people who, who do, um, you know, livestock production around here, and yeah, finding, uh, you know, a, a good local processor who can handle them has been tough, and I know, um, you know, especially in the last couple of years of this pandemic, uh, for some of our uh, processors, you know, they're getting to a point where they're wanting to retire, nobody was really wanting to take over for them, you know, and, it, and the, and the producers, some of the producers around here really depend on, and we're just like kind of freaking out a little bit, like, what am I going to do now? If you, you know, if you retire. So, um, you know, I'm sure that, you know, I mean, the, yeah, the more processing facilities we have around, you know, just in the state in general, I think is, is only good. I mean, not only good for, for business and, you know, and for your co-op and people like you, but also just, you know, in kind of the larger environmental sense, it, you know, one of the things that has never made sense to me, you look around, you know, we probably have more cows than people in this state. And, um, and yet, you know, all of the, you know, the vast majority of the, the meat that you're going to see on the shelves in the grocery stores, is probably being shipped here from Chicago or someplace like that, right? It's like we take all the cattle, put them on truck, <laughs> ship them, you know, maybe a 1000 miles, slaughter them, wrap them in plastic and then ship them back here it just makes no sense whatsoever so um you know it's this uh you know kind of localizing more of that supply chain um is really great so hope it uh works out well for you and we'll all be uh pulling for you and thank I'll you definitely be contacting everybody i know uh in in helena missoula that might be interested in one of your shares or any place that you're you're selling and encourage them to get on board with that as soon as you open up those uh those the csa uh, side of things well thank you yeah um before we wrap it up here is there anything else uh that you would like to to put out there any uh you know we've got got kind of a national audience of, of worker co-op uh people and um so if you've, if you've, uh, I don't know, it, <laughs> if there's a question that I didn't ask you that you wish I would have asked you, you can answer it now. <laughs> okay, well, uh, I don't think necessarily there's a question uh, that you didn't ask. Um, 
I guess I would just say that, um, you know, everybody out there who's working on um, co-ops, you know, I, I just share those values of trying to um, increase our local and regional control of, of our own destiny when it comes to food and land management and to, um, we, we really do value this, you know, decreasing the, uh, there's, there we go, I kept trying to get the camera, decreasing that gap between the highest and lowest paid employees and trying to, um, you know, basically ensure that um, there still needs to be a gap. There's really no way to solve that, but the gap sure needs to be a much less than it is traditionally or, you know, yeah. recent, relatively recently in our history. And um, when more people are doing good enough, um, that's, that, that is uh, security and fairness. Um, and that, you know, they're just less vulnerable overall. Mm -hmm. And um, that makes each, each of us more secure, I think. And so that, those are values we share, I think, with the co-op audience across the country. And, and then the last thing I'd say is that we, I think one of our, the, one of the core reasons we create, we created this co-op just, you know, at this scale in Montana is the global perception of livestock and its impact on climate and uh, health. I believe it is really mistaken. And, um, and yet I share the values of a lot, a lot of the, people who have those concerns I, I think that they they're concerned for good reasons um, but I think that the the actual facts about um, impact on climate and impact on health are unfortunately not uh, very well understood and mm -hmm. we really would see livestock as an essential part of the foundation of any sustainable agricultural system and the integration of livestock and cropping systems as a key soil health solution. Um, and we really see meat as a nourishing component of the, of the diet. And so we, I don't think we can necessarily win the global battle of perception over that, but we can just have as many thoughtful conversations as possible. And you can only have thoughtful, nuanced conversations usually at the local level, at a smaller scale. And so this kind of, you know, um, I don't know, the appropriate technology, National Center for Appropriate Technology, appropriate scale, um, businesses that have enough scale to, to invest in, in the capital you need to operate, but not so much that people become anonymous. Um, mm -hmm. That we just, that's, I think, why we're doing that. And I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that that's why a lot of people out there have started co ops and are structuring that way. So thanks for the network of expertise that we're relying on to try to start this up. And uh, all the, and even, you know, you, you sent me some great contacts that are already helping us out. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess great. thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that's, uh, Thanks for, for spending the time today and, and sharing your story and uh, best of luck with the, with the co-op. Thank you so much.